Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, delighted that you could join us for uh, the launch of Libby Davies' uh, book, Outside In, a political memoir. Uh, this is really a celebratory uh, occasion and it's really, I think, uh, going to be a Libby love-in uh, today. <laughs> I just wanted to begin by recognizing uh, that we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples. Uh, my name is Am Joel, I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and uh, thank you to SFU's Institute for the Humanities and Between the Lines Publishing for uh, partnering uh, on this event. We'll let you know a little bit more about uh, how tonight will uh, unfold, but I just wanted to begin by um, uh, uh, introducing a special guest that we have here who's gonna share some uh, words with us, former SFU uh, public policy professor, former member of parliament and a colleague of Libby's and currently the mayor of Vancouver. Uh, please welcome Kennedy Stewart. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, also wanted to acknowledge we're on the unceded territories of uh, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil Waututh. And man, is it fun building a city of reconciliation. We are getting along so well with the host nations, and really look forward to uh, what we can seeing what we can do here in the city. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here this evening, and to prompt you all to buy this book because it is a really great book. It's. Uh, it is uh, a fantastic read, and, uh, and I know a lot of you in the room have been part of this. Uh, my journey with Libby started at the First United Church basement in about 1993, where Seth Klein and I had just finished our master's degrees at SFU, and Libby invited me down to uh, talk about ward systems. Uh, and then I got hooked, uh, worked for Joy McPhail in her 1996 campaign, and met lots of you through this adventure, uh, but then got to serve in Parliament with Libby, uh, and Don Davies is here as well, uh, so they've, uh, we've been serving together, and thrill of a lifetime or what, to go into Parliament in 2011 with uh, the great Libby Davies and Jack Layton. Uh, what an experience, and it really set me up for uh, the job I'm doing now, which is uh, Mayor of Vancouver, which I still have to pinch myself occasionally uh, to, to believe. Uh, and Libby has really been uh, that to me, that she's been to, to a lot of uh, folks in this city has been a, a hero and a mentor, uh, and it, it really, she is a very, very special person, as we all know, a rarity in politics, somebody with integrity, uh, able to stand up for th those folks who need standing up for, always ahead of the curve in terms of justice issues and not never backs down, uh, and I mean, what can you say other than that? She's been uh, fantastic for the city in her, in her long uh, tenure as a as an activist and as a and as a as city councillor and uh, and then in parliament so really a national treasure and it's such a great uh, honor to to share the stage with her this evening the last time I guess I'll end with this the last time we were at this building was uh, during our mayoral, the, the mayoralty campaign and uh, Libby and I uh, stood and announced uh, with Karen Ward who's also here this evening uh, the, uh, we were gonna have a, a, a task force on overdoses if I uh, was elected and we were able to win the election by a squeaker again, that's my forte. And, uh, and then had this overdose task force that we're really working hard uh, here in the downtown east side and right across the city to try to, try to save lives and, and make lives better. So uh, others, of course, my wife Jeanette Ash is here today. We got Councillor Jean Swanson and I, I mean, I get Ellen Woodsworth like, it's amazing who's here tonight <laughs> celebrating. I'm just like, I'll go right down the row and have everybody back and forth. But I really just uh, looking forward to hearing what the panel says. Of course, Christine Boyle, counselor here as well, and we'll hear from her a little later. Uh, so I uh, just want to say great thrill to be here tonight. Make sure you buy the book. It's, it's a fantastic read, and it's not only looking at, at the past and, and what's been accomplished, but a lot of hope of what we can do in the future, which is, which is uh, Libby's forte. So thanks very much for letting me speak this evening, and I can't wait to hear the rest. Thanks. It's really important to uh, support uh, Canadian publishing. It's a very difficult uh, area to, to be in. It's great that Libby is uh, published with Between the Lines. So I'm just going to invite up Zoe Grams, who's been uh, the publicist for this book. So please welcome Zoe. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Zoe Grams, and as Am says, I'm just thrilled that we're able to support uh, Outside In. Um, I'm here to say a few words on behalf of the publishers, but between the lines. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Mary Stewart, for being here for introducing this event. Thank you to um, Am Johal at SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and SFU Woodwards for um, providing us with this beautiful space and really um, supporting and stewarding this event. Um, we, as you know from being upstairs, we do have books for sale, so thanks to Book Warehouse for being here and um, for their work tonight and for tirelessly selling independent authors uh, 365 days of the year. Once um, this event concludes, you can still buy copies of the book, but we will actually be moving the book selling table down to this floor on the second floor to the World Art Center. Um, you can buy a copy of the book there, and you can also enjoy uh, a reception there, which will take place after this event. Um, uh, and Libby will be gladly signing copies there. Um, if you uh, aren't able to get a book tonight for whatever reason, or if you'd like more than one copy, I highly recommend that you um, uh, go to one of our independent bookstores in the city. We have a really incredible community, and so please support them. And I wouldn't be a publicist if I didn't ask you to please share your thoughts about this incredible memoir on social media, um, on any kind of review website. I can't tell you what a difference it makes, so thank you in advance. Um, and finally, thank you to Libby Davies, um, not only for her exemplary and tireless work, but also for sharing her story in such a powerful and candid and really galvanizing memoir. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. Uh, we're just going to be in, in conversation with Libby and a few uh, guests for about a half an hour, 40 minutes. We're not going to do a Q&A, but if you do have questions uh, at the reception, at the book signing on the second floor, immediately uh, after the event, you'll be able to speak to people uh, directly. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, uh, the guests that are going to be joining us. Uh, Christine Boyle, she's a newly elected councillor with One City Vancouver, community organizer, <laughs> climate justice activist ordained United Church minister, and she previously did national climate justice organizing amongst uh, diverse faith communities. We've collaborated on things here uh, at SFU, so thank you very much for, for joining us up here. And uh, Karen Ward is an artist and activist who's a former board member of Van Du, a former collective member at Gallery Gachet. Uh, Karen advises on drug policy, poverty reduction at the city of Vancouver, and community engagement in the downtown east side with marginalized communities. Uh, welcome, Karen. <laughs> And of course, uh, Libby Davies needs no uh, 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 introduction. She, of course, uh, is a former community organizer, city councillor in Vancouver, a member of parliament. And please give a warm welcome to Libby Davies. <laughs> so I'll start off uh, with you, Libby. What, uh, how, uh, after your, uh, after your last time as being a, a member of parliament, uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, you had a lot of times and a lot of opportunities to um, uh, do different types of work and political organizing. And uh, obviously it takes a long time to sit down and start writing a book. And it, of course, uh, worked in the downtown east side as a community organizer on city council. That was a really gruff uh, time when there were people in the media like uh, Jack Webster, you know, 9 a.m. precisely. There were big uh, political figures uh, that you worked with at the time. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, how you started to think about writing a memoir. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, and uh, first of all, hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to see you all. Old friends, new friends. Um, thank, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I, I really appreciate it. It's a beautiful evening. You could have done many other things. So thank you for being here. And um, I have to say this one thing because it's really embarrassing about Kim. I think I left my book in the washroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I left it on the top of the toilet paper thing. <laughs> so, but I do want to say, um, I just want to give a shout out. To, no, it's, I, 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 my book is smart, but I do want to give a huge shout out to Kim. Anybody who knows Kim Elliott knows how amazing she is. 
And I do want to say that I could not have written this book. She helped with the editing. I could not have found the photographs, all the advice, and she saw me crying and lying on the bed and saying, okay, that's it, I've had it. So I, I just want to say Kim is just an amazing person that many of you know, so, so it's... I just want to say that. <laughs> so hopefully she'll find my book in the washroom because <laughs> it's got stickies on it. Um, so the question, uh, what was it like back in those days? Well, you know, my son, Leif Erikson, and where is Leif? I know he's, there he is up there. <clears throat> Many of you know Leif Erikson. You've seen pictures of him as a baby. Leif sent me this incredible video that he found online of... Um, Bruce and I, in 1982, Bruce was already a city councillor, and I, was, I had been on the park board, and I was running for city council, and we went on the Webster show on BCTV, and George Pule, God, who remembers George Pule? <laughs> <clears throat> he says, ah, now Erickson's trying to get his wife elected. Well, first of all, we weren't married. <laughs> and... And, and this became an issue over the years. And, um, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I really did leave it in the washroom. <laughs> and so they kind of poked fun at Bruce and he started saying, um, you know, women have the right to vote, women should be running. And I, and I was so proud of him for like, not only defending me, but all women. And then Webster got to interview me and he has a go at me as well. And it's like, oh, so, you know, you're married to this guy and you're running now. Well, and who's going to look after the kid? You know? <laughs> and and I, I am so polite. Honestly, I, first of all, I was pretty young. I am so goddamn polite that I think now, if it happened, I would just, like, have kicked him in the balls or something. <laughs> but I was so polite. And, it, and it's really made me reflect on, first of all, what the media was like when you talk. I mean, it was much more rough and tumble. Um, and, but I'm so glad that young women today in politics, they would just not put up with that bullshit, you know? And I did. And, and I kind of beat myself up for it, but I shouldn't, right? Because that's another woman thing as well. We beat ourselves up when we think we've done something wrong. And we haven't really done anything wrong. Um, so, you know, in those days when I think about it, you know, uh, the reporters used to hang out at the cop shop. They were at City Hall. And it was really, you know, there was no, I mean, Jean will remember, we sometimes used to put out press releases, but it was mostly we would just go and pigeonhole the reporters and hang about and bug them and bug them and bug them. And, and Erickson was very good at doing that until we got the story that we wanted, right? And um, so I didn't, I didn't really learn about things like the message box and, uh, <laughs> and staying in the message box until I got to Ottawa. I mean, in those days, it was just sort of like a free-for-all. And even when you were a candidate running, uh, I don't really remember any training. You just kind of did it by the seat of your pants and sometimes just screwed it up and it was embarrassing and, and other times it was okay. So it was, it was a very different time in terms of the media and also how we did organizing. It was very, it was very kind of rough and tumble, you know, and we just, we just got out there and did. And I think in the book I, I say we kind of hurled ourselves at the brick walls at City Hall until we felt like maybe they started to crumble a bit. So it was a, you know, I, I don't think things were really managed. We just got out there and did it. So it, it's very different today. And I think probably better and that people are more analytical about what they're doing. And we still have, you know, actions that happen um, that are spontaneous and that's good. Now, uh, Libby worked on so many uh, issues, but one of the, the, the ones uh, uh, certainly that you pushed on, and, and um, it was really viewed as a radical thing then to push harm reduction policies. And, and Karen, I'm wondering if you can talk about how you met with Libby and, and the different things that you've worked with her on in terms of social policy. Okay. So I, I remember we had talked, I had, uh, this was two years ago in 2017, and it was in the early part of the summer, we, I had been emailing, and then you, you were away, I think, and we, met, we finally sorted it out, and we met at the Oval Team. Um, and it was, and we, had to keep, we kept having to change the time because it was complicated, and you know, I had to do this and that, and running around, and then we got there, and like, I only had a coffee, and you only had a tea, I think. And, uh, and, you, and it was right in the, it was in the, so it was in the early summer of 2017, and it was, and you'd been, you'd been away, like I said, and it was felt like the, I remember you said to me, you were shocked, and we had just really 
been corresponding, and I knew that you were an honorary member of Van Du. Um, and I, of course, I knew all you know the the, the history of the work, um, and I remember that we were talking, and the look you were just like, "What is happening here?" I mean, the people in the neighborhood are both uh, really raw and really tough at the same time, but everybody was just, it was just a mess. People were dying in the streets. Um, and it was a shocking thing to see from, from when you, like you have all that, you had all that history. And I think just us talking that day, that morning, early morning, it was like I saw the shock reflected in you. And then you were also seeing the, how terrible it was um, through how I was trying to describe it. Um, and then I guess you kind of kicked my ass to get to figure out a better way to go about things. Um, instead of being churned around in, a, in the crisis to, to take a step, not to take, not to take a step back, but to take a few different looks at things and try to find a way to think about it as a politic, political problem. So, and that was, and that gave me a, one of those. So I, I, I um, because that, and now, I mean, we're still in that, to it because that's a very difficult way to look at things while, you know, uh, I was saying the, uh, the ground is, you know, the ground is crumbling and the sky is falling. Um, so, but you gave me a new frame to think about it and a, new, a different language to think about it because I also saw how I was struggling to articulate what was happening had a real effect on you and I remember that very clearly. And in, in, in Libya, I remember as well the times that you worked with, with Bud Osborne in the, in the 90s in terms of advancing these things. And so you saw the situation in the late 90s, the situation uh, right now, which in, in many ways has become um, worse as well. But I think it'd be really interesting for, for people to hear about kind of how that uh, movement from the community side struggle was taken into Parliament. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of people here know Bud, maybe personally, or they know of him. Uh, Bud was at Van Du, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug drug Users, as well as Anne Livingston, and both Bud and Anne, but others like Earl Crow and Dean Wilson and uh, Brian, uh, many folks at Van Du, they had a huge impact on me. And before I went to Ottawa, um, with, there was the event in Oppenheimer Park where 1,000 wooden crosses were put up to um, to represent the overdoses that had happened. And so I kind of went to Ottawa with this feeling that I was compelled, that I had a duty to try and raise this issue in Ottawa. I didn't quite know how to do it, but I knew what I had to do. And I stayed in contact with Bud, I mean, not daily, but certainly weekly. And every time I came back to Vancouver, I would meet with Bud, sometimes with Anne. I would go to Van Du meetings. You know, there'd be like 100 people sitting on the floor, Anne with her flip charts, writing down what people were saying. And, and, and it was through that that I learned the true nature of, of the crisis and how people were criminalized, how they were treated, how they were shut out of everywhere and everything, and how people were, were trying to assert their very basic human rights. Um, so it was a very powerful time. And, and I have to say, personally, at the same time, um, Bruce had just died a few months before. And I, I, I was really sort of suffering myself. I hadn't really dealt with uh, the grief very well. And I, looking back, I feel like what was going on in the downtown east side, somehow the grief went into that, you know? And, and this sense of empathy that, you know, that, that here we could... People didn't have to die. These were preventable deaths. So in my own head, those two things, Bruce's death and what was happening in the downtown east side um, with the overdoses, were really closely connected and, and how I kind of responded to it. And, um, and it just became a mission in Ottawa, right? Like any way I could to raise this issue and to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But it was the people in, in this community who, who really led me to do that, right? I think if I'd not had that, you go to Ottawa and there's Dawn Black who's here, former MP and, and Don Davies and Kennedy, you, you know what Ottawa's like, right? It kind of sucks you in, right? All that intrigue and you know who's doing what to who. And so to keep focused, about 
what you're there for and what you represent is, you know, it actually is a challenge, right? And so being grounded in this community with people like Bud um, was really, really important to, um, to my political work and what I needed to do. I was in the audience at one of those meetings in like 1998 that your office organized with Bandu, so mm -hmm. it was deeply affecting to a lot of uh, people yeah. at the time. Uh, so Chris, you've recently been elected to, to, to city council, having done community organizing work and walking into this situation, and you've had a chance to collaborate with Libby, and I'm wondering if you could share you know, how you think about your role on council right now, given uh, the legacy of people uh, like Libby in terms of the political space they've opened up. Yeah, that was a, a key part of what I kept thinking about in the book. One of the things that really struck me in the book was how um, uh, you named by name so many people who you were collaborating with, but also who were mentoring and supporting you in that um, uh, because of my experience of you being such a um, valuable support and mentorship, that theme came out for me too. And um, and so it means a lot to me to get to be here um, and to have other people in the room who uh, have been mentors for me. I, when I was first debating whether I should run, I had coffee with Libby, I had coffee with a lot of people and um, got a whole mixed bag of advice, um, uh, as you can imagine, including more uh, fashion advice than I really thought was appropriate. Um, uh, and I was medium polite, I'm going to say, in response to it. Um, but I, uh, I still have in my notebook pages of notes that I took from uh, chatting with Libby um, about everything uh, from running with young kids to activism in politics and uh, and across the board, and um, and I think that the role of of mentors uh, is really important. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the obvious um, piece that comes up throughout the book of how uh, we engage across social movements um, and uh, and partisan politics is huge, and I have ha been having a hard time figuring that out so far in City Hall. It's a hard adjustment. Um, from doing whatever the fuck you want to do um, to being in this position where you kind of have to at least second guess and temper what your role is in relation to the larger system in order to kind of get the work done and keep moving it forward. Um, and uh, and there, there are limited examples of, of people pushing really hard on that um, and a number of them are in the room uh, and Libby is one of them and so to read about those stories from uh, from movements that I wasn't part of uh, and to draw on what I've seen Libby do in politics uh, is hugely valuable as I'm thinking through how do I react to this, what's my role, how hard can I push, how do I, uh, how do I play this from inside and support and encourage the movements happening outside is been Can I just add one thing? I, I think that's actually one of the really tough things is figuring out your role, you know? Like whether it's on the inside or the outside, it's like figuring out how you do what you need to do. Like we know what we wanna do, but how you do it. And I, I actually struggled with that as a new MP. It's like, how do I make myself relevant in this huge place? And I'm sure maybe that's something that you're facing at City Hall, right? Cause it's, you're, you feel like you're in two worlds. Do you find that? You're sort of like in the formal, you know, City Hall world. And then there's the community, right? And people's expectations about what you can do. And you're kind of moving back and forth. And it, it's sometimes really hard to navigate. Yes, agreed. Hard. Yeah, yeah. And so great to have people to ask and examples to show. And um, also, uh, also it meant a lot to me in the book to be able to read your kind of uh, imposter syndrome and your own questioning of it because you sort of feel like, well, everyone else. I mean, it has just has always seemed to me that clearly you knew what you were doing, um, and. Uh, <laughs> and so it's reassuring that you didn't always know what you're doing and that, that navigating that line is kind of an ongoing process. It is reassuring when I, six months into office, give myself a hard time, because that's what we do, about not yet having figured it all out. And, you know, I think one of the challenges as well is that, you know, if you're the 
MP for Vancouver East, it's almost of uh, national importance in terms of the progressive positions that you take, given the history of the riding, its kind of geographic kind of piece of it, and this kind of challenge of straddling, uh, as Christine said, how do you uh, create uh, political possibility on the progressive side and at the same time maintain good relations uh, with your colleagues and to, and to push things uh, forward? We're oftentimes in East Vancouver, we're in an oppositional stance because the powers that be are, um, it's, it's um, not necessarily widely held political beliefs sometimes. Mm -hmm. and so. Yes, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, I think again, it comes down to this issue of um, building relationships. Um, and I did want to say actually that Shane Simpson is here. Um, who's who's also been a person who's kind of been in the community and activist and is now great cabinet minister um, and it's really hard to to kind of navigate these worlds but I, I do think it is about the relationships you build um, I I felt it for me in Ottawa, there were times where I felt really frustrated with um, the NDP caucus because I felt like um, people weren't doing enough on what I wanted to do. And now when I look back, I feel that actually people gave me a lot of space to do things and to speak out because especially in the early days, like the idea of safe injection sites and and uh, sex worker rights and things like this, like, you know, it was kind of not the mainstream political stuff, right? That, that you expect to see in Ottawa. And so even within the caucus, people were like, oh my God, like, who is this? And what what is she up to? But I realized that people actually did give me space. So I think it's a, it is about building those relationships. And for me, it was always about the issues. And what I, what I really don't like in the political world is when it, it gets so personal and people start slagging each other. And, and, this is, and I, I do talk about this in the book. It, it really kind of gets to me, you know, particularly on the left where we see people just kind of going after each other and this sense of judgment. You know what? We all screw up. You know, like we all have got stories where we could have done something better or there was a horrible mistake or whatever it was. And, and so I feel like we have, to, we have to learn how to support each other better in the progressive movement, right? And we have to recognize that there's all kinds of people and they're at different levels of activism or their analysis of what's going on. But if we, if we have this idea that we know best, I, I just don't feel we get very far. And it, and it kind of breaks down. <clears throat> and it's, and you know, sometimes I was even afraid to say that for, you know, for feeling like, oh my God, somebody's gonna jump on me for that. But I, I kind of feel like it needs to be said. And, and our relationships with each other as progressives, um, with, the, with the NDP, like this, this was a big theme in the book, right, for me was how do we as activists work with our allies who are, um, maybe elected or, or in government, right? That's sometimes the hardest thing to do, like figuring out what those boundaries are, what the communication is. Uh, and and I, I mean, I don't have all the answers to that, Am. I'm, you know, I'm still thinking about that stuff, and so I'm very interested to hear what other people have to say. Um, but it is about the relationships at the end of the day, you know? And when times are tough, those relationships actually get you through. I have uh, another question for you, Libby. Um, you had a chance to see a lot of prime ministers, NDP political leaders up close, and now that you're not an MP, can you dish a little bit? Uh, <laughs> Am told me he was going to ask me this question before. Um, well, I do, you know, thinking about um, Thomas Mulcair, you know, he, has, he had this sort of reputation, right, of like, being tough in parliament and, you know, was he approachable when he was outside? But I, I mean, I sat next to him for, for quite a few years and watched him in the house. And what cracked me up about Tom Mulcair was that he was actually a stand-up comic and he had this amazing ability to do every single Monty Python <laughs> a character like with a, with a really good accent that I couldn't do. And so it's so... Um, sort of contradictory to how maybe you see him, right? This idea that he was actually really a comic and that in, in the middle of question period, he was mimicking and, and um, you know, quietly, you know, um, and, and putting on his brilliant Monty Python voices. So I, I always remember that about Thomas Mulcair. And, and for Jack, you know, uh, I mean, Jack was just such an amazing guy. Um, 
I always remember him at our, uh, what we called our caucus retreats at various locations. You know, the first thing he would do is if there was a piano, he'd sit down at the piano and start playing. And before we knew it, everybody was singing. Um, and, you know, that was just so delightful to know that, that this guy was so down to earth. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I interacted with these various prime ministers. I remember once being in an elevator with Paul Martin in the West Block, this rickety old elevator that always broke down. It was in my first few days there. And um, I was, it was me and him and his staff person. And I was actually terrified. It was like, oh my God, this is the Minister of Finance. This is actually why I ran, because I'm so friggin' mad at him because he cut all the housing programs. And here he is in the elevator with me. And he looked at me and he said, hello, Ms. Davies. And how are you? And I was so stunned. Like, how does this guy know my name? Right? <laughs> that I, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I didn't say anything. And um, so, you know, and then Kretchen, who was um, a very kind of affable guy, you know, um, very laid back, but man, tough as nails, ruthless in his caucus. Um, so, you know, these characters, and Harper, I, I had a couple of formal meetings with Harper. And he was um, such a reserved and very formal person who wanted to get down to business. And the one meeting that I had with him in the, his office with Bill Blakey, when we were um, trying to make sure that the, what was called the NDP budget deal, where I think it was $5.4 billion or something, had been transferred to housing and education and transportation and pensions, uh, we wanted to make sure that the money wasn't lost. And, um, and I thought it was gonna be really tough, but he was actually very no-nonsense, and he gave us an assurance um, that that money that was booked would not be lost um, in his new budget. Um, so it was, I, I mean, I was surprised, right, that he was so forthcoming, and he was, yeah, yeah we'll honor that deal, he said. Now, uh, there's a... He a didn't honor many other things. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there's still obviously a, a lot of issues. Um, you worked a lot in the downtown east side neighborhood, your community organizing here. I'm wondering if you could maybe share with us what you'd like to see elected people do in terms of uh, some of the, 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 the issues that you're working on right now. I, I think, I, so I think that understanding the downtown east side is something that takes like, I mean, I'll, um, I was gonna say a lifetime, but it doesn't, you don't get that. Um, anymore. Um, it takes a long time. It takes, and it's a difficult situation to be part of it. Well, not be part of, but to look at. If you're not part of it, it's a difficult thing to understand and be cl and look closely at because it's it's very it's very painful. Um, it's very hard to look at. Um, I think that elected people need to understand th that um, there is no downtown east side. It's this is where people. It's like a magnet. You know, I mean, this is where people come from who are hurt from all over the country and all over the province and the world. Um, it's like a magnet for pain. And it's all of ours. It's our history. Um, and so we can't just say, we're, you know, I mean, I've heard elected people say, um, where do these people come from? Why? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, yeah, that's right. That's exactly it. People, come, This is a place where it was, I remember I was saying, it was like 2000, I guess it was 2014. I guess um, I was saying that there, it is like this. It becomes, this is a place where people can be hurt and different and still okay and find people like them and be and cycle through in many ways. And I remember the, um, and, and get through, work through, feel through whatever they are dealing with. And many, many will, you know, emerge and come and do something else, or find something other way, find another way to live, or find some art to throw themselves into, or find a place that they can care about. Um, and and uh, and that's all. Of, like that's this is the. It's it's like a it is it's like a magnet for the, for the violence of the nation, you know. And that's got to be understood. It's all of our problems, not just here not just the mean and Hastings. Um, I think that's, that's the key to it. And I, I, and of course now, people don't get to cycle through, right? They come, there's like, a, you know, these are runaways. Kids come down here for, come down here when they're, you know, whatever, 18, or they're, you know, they're getting kicked out of Parksville and Quinnell and Penticton because you're not allowed to be homeless or sleep on the sidewalk. 
and in you know in Parksville, you you know they're inventing new bylaws to uh, get to take people who are homeless and get them get them out of town. And where do they come? They come here, and then two weeks later they've died. They're dead of an overdose. So we need to understand that this these are our these are our kids that we're throwing away who come down here. That these are all of our problems. Karen, can I add one thing to what you said? I. I, I follow I follow Karen really closely on Instagram, and she what what did, what is your name on Instagram? I forgot. Karen, uh, Karen Ward, Wardism, and she does these. In, she kind of I I kind of feel like you prowl around the neighborhood, I go all hours of the day, and she does these incredible photographs that are sometimes so minute, of like something that she sees on a the bottom of a wall or something in an alley. And, but the, those photographs, for me, they just capture something about the neighborhood that yeah. we don't, you know, because we're rushing by on the bus or on a bicycle or in a car or walking that we don't see, right? And so, um, anyway, you might well, want to cool. take a look at some of Karen's photos on Instagram. They're really amazing. Uh, Chris, I had a, a question for you. Um, now that, you know, you've gone from doing community organizing work to running in a campaign, getting elected to city council and being, you know, maybe a little bit over six months uh, into it. Uh, now that you're on this side, what words of advice would you have for uh, young people running for politics, particularly uh, young women? I mean, it's, I still feel like my primary job is as an organizer. Um, and I remember somebody telling me, um, when I was thinking about running, that people think about elected office in a number of different ways. They think of their role there as representing people, or they think of their role there as, you know, making good policy decisions and being kind of primarily a, a policy person. Um, and, and I still feel like the work is connecting with people, uh, helping mobilize people in support of um, good issues, and, and in particular because we have a m kind of minority government situation um, at City Hall right now. Um, I still think the work is uh, organizing. Um, I don't know that I've been there long enough to have any uh, advice for anyone, I, except the sort of trite stuff that I am, quite frankly, not always doing a great job of following, which is like to not read the comments and... Um, <laughs> don't read the comments. You know, like stay off, uh, I tried to, my rule was that I wouldn't look at social media after 9 p.m. because it was really making it hard to sleep at night. Um, I mean, there's really basic stuff like that. Um, but I do think still it's, um, uh, it's an organizing role because the work is still um, trying to move issues along and, and I can't do that alone from my position. And, and Libby, you know, when you're representing uh, uh, East Vancouver as a member of parliament and coming from that grassroots organizer, uh, East Vancouver has got such a long history of anarchists and socialists. And, you know, I, I have many friends in East Vancouver who don't vote, you know. And, and one of the things you take up in the book is sort of a case of why uh, people should get involved in electoral politics because it matters. I'm wondering if you can, if you're talking to a young person who doesn't mm. vote or engage or thinks that uh, that level of politics isn't relevant in the political realm, how would you uh, take up that argument? Well, um, it's it's actually one of the reasons that I wanted to write, is that I wanted to share my own experiences, but also talk about this issue of how people feel so disempowered, how they feel so disillusioned and often cynical about the political process. And to me, when people are turned off, or even worse, when they're oppressed you know, by the voting system, um, when people feel shut down, um, then things don't happen, right? It's so I, I wanted to get across that. When, when people are engaged at whatever level, that's when change happens. Whether we're elected, working with people, as Chris has, des has described, whether as Karen has described, um, people in this neighborhood who are trying to find a way to engage. To me, that's what, it, what it's about. And I think in the book, near the end, I talk about how really voting is just the outcome, you know? Like I get so mad that before an election, people say, oh, you know, you have to vote, and you know, it's your duty, and this. Like voting is the outcome of people 
knowing their own voice and that they, they have a reason and a belief that they can vote for something that's part of something, a bigger change. And I, I would say to people when I was out mainstreeting, and I would often meet young people who felt very alienated. Uh, maybe they were anarchists and on principle, you know, they weren't voting. And I was saying, you know what? When you don't vote, you're giving more power to the people who already have power because they know what their class interest is, right? They know that voting is just like one little thing that you do every election, right? It's all the other stuff. So I always try to kind of move it more upstream in terms of where's that point of engagement, because when we have that, and when we have that connection between activists and social movements, and we know how to interact with elected people and not just dismiss it and say, you know, they're all bad, there is corruption in politics, you know, there's a corruption in a lot of places. But if we don't engage, we're actually giving away so much power. And, and I, I, I hope that comes across in the book because um, I, th I think we have, to, we have to learn. We have to learn how to work with each other and we have to learn how to use the political system for the really big changes that we want to see. And of course, you know, one of the really big things right now is global warming, right? And I think it's so brilliant that we have um, this initiative across the country, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 that people are signing up for a pact for a new green deal. I mean, I really hope it's going to influence what happens in the federal election, you know? And I want my party to be really bold on this issue and to speak the truth about what we need to do with our economy, right? And there's, there are going to be changes that are really hard, but I believe that the NDP is the party that has to do that because we do have the connection with the labor movement. But if we don't engage, if we get cynical, if we say, well, see, they didn't do what we want, like then, then we've lost it, right? So you have to keep at it. It is really about the long haul. And I know Jean's always said that. It's about the long haul and staying in there and fighting and on many different levels. And so it's one of the reasons I wanted to write. And now that your book's been recovered from the bathroom, I wonder if you'd be willing to read a little uh, piece from it before we head to the reception. Uh, would, do people want that or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What should I do, just do it from here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If it's easy for you to go up there too, whenever you're comfortable. Well, I don't want you to think that the whole book is about the downtown east side because it isn't. There's many other issues and experiences in here, but I just I just picked one out because we are uh, we're we're just well we're in the downtown east side, and uh, this is um, actually Am you were you were kind of like part of this. Um, in February 2010, a day after the federal government announced it would go to the Supreme Court of Canada to oppose Insight's operation, Harper's planned visit with seniors at the Chinese Cultural Center a few blocks away garnered a welcome from friends of Insight. The group demanded that Harper, on tour leading up to the 20, uh, 2010 Vancouver Olympics, stop his government's latest attack on Insight and at least pay a visit to see it for himself. Friends of Insight placed yellow tape around the perimeters of the premises, and I watched, supporting my constituents who were drawing attention to the Prime Minister's rare visit to the neighborhood. The next thing I knew, my Blackberry was buzzing like crazy, and Carl Belanger, Leighton's press attache, was frantically asking me, what's going on? Then a, then a message from Mitchell Rafel from McLean saying, Libby, do you know what they're saying about you? Finally, a message from Jack himself. Is there anything I need to know about what's going on? <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, Dimitri Soudas, the Prime Minister's Director of Communications, had put out a message to the media that the MP for Vancouver East was responsible for blocking the exit of seniors who were meeting with the Prime Minister. What? Of course, this simply wasn't the case, but that didn't matter to the Conservatives as long as it could be used to motivate their base for political gain.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christine and Karen, for, for sharing your thoughts and sharing the stage here with uh, Libby. Uh, we're going to be moving over to the World Arts Centre in the second floor of the building. You can either go through those doors there or out those doors. But uh, before we do, please give a warm uh, uh, thank you to Libby. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne.